All right, welcome back everyone to another virtual shouting session this week. Um, to start off our Monday, we're gonna be joined by Dr. Badia. He is a hand surgeon based in Miami. Um, he has a lot going on. We're really appreciative that you can make some time, Dr. Badia, to join us. I do have a few reminders though for the students listening in, especially if you're new to virtual shadowing in general, because we do have a few students who pop in that are new. So just for some background, for some context, with each of these sessions, we have different speakers, we have different specialties, and at the very end, we do have Q&As. So if there are any questions that you have for Dr. Badia or any future speakers that we have along our way, please feel free to type them in the chat. The chat is either to the right-hand side or just below the live stream that you're viewing right now. Um, and you can type that in at any point in time. We're gonna have the Q&A at the very end and I'll be reading out questions uh, in the order that we receive them. The second and last reminder I wanna shout out is our um, just how we go about spreading the word about our our sessions. So there's two ways that we, we announce sessions. There's our Instagram page and there's our listserv. Our listserv is something that you can subscribe to. On our website, we have a subscription page at the very bottom. Um, and if you hop onto our shadowing page, you'll see the subscription at the very bottom. Scroll all the way down, just fill in your name, your email, and you'll be good to go. Or you can also just directly email us at community at G, or, or sorry, community at hearts for, that being the number four, health. Uh, org. I'll also include that email at the bottom um, in our description at the very end of today's um, today's session. And also feel free to email us with any questions that you have. Our Instagram is another place that we um, post flyers, and that's probably how a lot of y'all have heard about us. Um, you can follow us on Instagram to hear more. But not to take up too much time, Dr. Bazia, feel free to take it away. Okay, terrific. Um, okay. Uh, you can you can see my my slide perfectly yep. now. Yep. Okay. So thank you, uh, uh, you know, team from uh, Hearts for Health. I think this is a great idea, and I want to give you some thoughts by somebody, a surgeon who's been in the trenches for about thirty years. Some uh, things to ponder as you as you go into your career, um, and then I'll, I'll I'll definitely throw in some cases here and there to make it interesting clinically, but I think the, the greater picture is what I'm excited to share with you. Uh, and so why are these type of discussions needed? Well, we know that US healthcare costs are not really sustainable. Um, we just got a, a interesting legislation, which I'm excited about. I've been talking about this authorization uh, obstacle that all of us clinicians face where an insurance company has to you know, authorize us. And I, I, I think it's an absurd concept and it, that just um, is uh, hopefully going to go into law. So we are, that's being discussed in uh, DC as we speak. Because consumers are indeed dissatisfied, uh, the markers, US health markers, are not where they should be compared to other industrialized countries. Our mortality rates are worse, our infant mortality, um, uh, pre pregnancy, you know, the complications are higher. So, one of the things we need to understand is healthcare doesn't necessarily need to be hospital care. So when somebody asks me as a surgeon, what, oh, what hospital do you work at? I, I, I honestly, it really bothers me because I think, well, yes, if I was a cardiothoracic surgeon, yes, I'd have to be at a hospital, but many, many surgeons do not need to be necessarily in a hospital. And hospitals have their place, but I'll, I'll show you that healthcare is really much bigger than simply the, the hospital. Um, and all of us entrepreneurs, and I think for uh, young people nowadays in medicine to really uh, flourish, you, you need to have an entrepreneurial spirit. You need to have, understand some business concepts. Otherwise, the system can really uh, swallow you up. So uh, background, I know that uh, you want to talk about kind of my evolution. I grew up in Elizabeth, New Jersey. I'm uh, totally a public school kid. I was a, a competitive swimmer. In high school, I uh, played a little soccer. I wasn't very good. Uh, both of my kids are very good soccer players, um, and they are teenagers, so I'm living that through them. And I was lucky enough uh, through a variety of um, things that came together as I ended up uh, getting in from my public school in, in New Jersey and Elizabeth to uh, Cornell University, which uh, I would do all over again if I had the chance. Uh, so I was in the arts and science college. I majored in physiology because it's what I liked. It's what I thought I was best at and managed to go to NYU Med, unfortunately, decades before it became one of the free medical schools. Um, I'm sure you, you were all hearing about that. 
And then I stayed at that big institution, which is a combination of Bellevue Hospital, the oldest uh, public hospital in existence. And it is the main trauma center for the city of New York, not just a psychiatric institution, as many people believe. Uh, so that was also at NYU, the private hospitals and the Manhattan VA. So I had a very good, broad experience. Uh, I went and did a hand and surgery an upper extremity fellowship in Pittsburgh and followed that by an awarded fellowship through an organization called AO, which is a German word basically for fixed bone. And that was in, in Germany. Then I came into practice in Miami in 1995, and I co-founded uh, a center that would, would later become very well-renowned. I'm very proud of it. Outside the university, uh, it grew from two hand surgeons, uh, me and, and, and George, uh, to five hand surgeons. And then around 2000, um, let's say it was 2008 or so, it, it, 2007, 2008, it started to kind of fell apart. Um, Often happens in groups. Long story, it's, I talk about it in my book, which I'll reference uh, several times. And I think the evolution of, of a physician through college, med school, residency, I talk about extensively in the first section of my book. Uh, and I, uh, I then left and started my own uh, um, hand center called Badia Hand to Shoulder Center because I was an upper limb surgeon. I then found that many patients came to me in a very inefficient fashion. So I founded something called Ortho Now, which hopefully many of you will hear about because I am very much trying to find the right strategic partner. So basically somebody to purchase the majority of Ortho Now. So I will stay involved and stay with equity, but I can't be a surgeon and run this business, which is essentially in a, a um, all of you know about the growth of urgent care centers in the U.S., but the problem is they don't have expertise in, in certain areas, particularly musculoskeletal. So, uh, so the idea is you would go there and in a very cost-effective and time-efficient manner, you would see somebody who actually knows uh, a lot about the musculoskeletal system. Uh, and then I, I built a surgery center on another one. Uh, this was in Doral next to my office. And then, and then a rehab center. So in, in one facility, I have kind of my own emergency room, my, my hand practice, a surgery center, therapy and imaging. So I haven't left my center in 10 years. And I, I used to be chief of hand surgery at Baptist, but I was never at the hospital. I was simply on staff. It was a wonderful uh, hospital like many others in Miami. But for what I do, I really didn't need the hospital. And then I'm very interested in academia, even though I had no academic title. Uh, so you'll notice that in everywhere you read about me, you'll never see assistant professor here. Um, I just realized a long time ago, you can do academia without necessarily being in academics. Not that I'm knocking academics, it's just a different model. It gives me a lot more freedom. Uh, so I, I was one of the co-founders of the MARC, which is the, uh, I think still the second largest surgical cadaver uh, training lab. So uh, typically companies will go there and it's it's a lot of it is orthopedics, not all, uh, but they will they will be able to do a uh, a a course and show, for example, say a new knee replacement comes in and Striker one one company says, okay, we're going to rent the Mark Center for uh, to do a course to introduce this new knee prosthesis to a bunch of surgeons will fly to Miami and hopefully try to have a little fun as well. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and then I, I've done some uh, uh, some sort of, the say, medical device work uh, with a, a small group called American Hand Institute, okay? So, but I'm, in the end, I'm this, and I say reluctant because I will tell you it is very difficult to be an entrepreneur in a system that is largely controlled by the insurance industry. So it's not like I say a friend of mine, she has... Um, a bunch of uh, sauces, cooking sauces, right? I mean, she has her challenges of bringing this to public supermarket or Walmart or whatever, but the, the client is the person eating, right? Who wants to buy the sauce. When we deliver healthcare, please realize the majority of the reimbursement is coming from a third party. And I hate to tell you, but that third party doesn't really care a lot. So, but we care. And that's why on a, you know, Monday, 
night all of you are listening to this because you really, all of you are very passionate about healthcare. You'd have to be, nobody would go to four years of college, four years of medical school, anywhere from three to seven to eight years of training if they weren't passionate. So please don't lose that passion. So this is my book. So if you can take a, a quick uh, screenshot or picture, um, I, I very much welcome feedback. Obviously, uh, you know, reviews on Amazon and giving the perspective of students, of the young people in healthcare is very important. And I was honored to give it to my alma mater um, in a uh, virtual talk uh, last year. Okay, so the main message here is that market forces as well as government reforms are gonna transform this landscape, but it's not sustainable. We do have the most expensive healthcare system in the world. And I can tell you in my specialty of orthopedics, we're all getting older. We're also more active, thank God, right? That's that's good, but that means there's more injuries uh, and then there's more problems like osteoarthritis. And some people say it accounts for 10% of all healthcare expenditures. And healthcare is now 20% uh, of all US GDP, gross domestic product. So do the math that, you know, the, the, the thing about musculoskeletal care is, is, is a very important economic uh, force. So we were in a perfect storm of healthcare, right? You know, I mentioned this, it is expensive. It can often be inefficient. It's excellent, no question. People come from all over the world. 30% of my practice are people who fly in for care because they know they get excellent care in the US, but it can be very inefficient, it's expensive. And lately it's been a little bit unfriendly um, and that's something important for healthcare. So keep that in mind. Uh, the people around you, whether it be, you know, your office staff, your colleagues, nurses, other colleagues, uh, realize that people are, are scared and are often in pain. But there is something else that added to this storm, which is not a Miami hurricane, by the way. This is a, a, an analogy for healthcare. And then came the pandemic. And the pandemic put, you know, everything topsy-turvy, as you know. Uh, but I do believe that there can be uh, some, some good that comes out of it. So Here's an article by uh, Patrick Vega, who's a, a healthcare analyst. I'm hoping to give a, a talk with him in Chicago in October, where he said that the COVID disruption actually created opportunities in outpatient care. Now, all of you know from everything I've said that I've been you know, sort of ahead of this curve. Uh, I, I have been a big believer in ambulatory and outpatient surgery because it is more cost-effective and more efficient. Um, but uh, many things like hip and knee replacements were still largely done in a hospital. And that has completely changed in the last three years. Uh, I'm not sure the data currently, but certainly in the next five years, the majority of hip and knee replacements will be done in outpatient centers, much like mine, uh, where uh, tomorrow I have, uh, I think, 14 cases. So very efficient. Um, so here's an article uh, that, that, um, that I, an interview that I did where I'm talking about these joint replacement surgeries. And it's really because COVID-19 has made patients aware that, hey, the hospital is not always the end all. There's not only you know, COVID exposure, but there is MRSA, methicillin resistant staph aureus, other bacteria that are entrenched in big hospitals, understandably so. Uh, but many of these clean surgeries do not necessarily need to be done there. So uh, this was from our, our uh, business journal. So, Fortunately, we have a governor that is uh, not as draconian, and we, we started removing the restrictions very early on in the pandemic. And by the way, I wrote my book in the first 10 weeks of the lockdown. So as soon as I finished the book, that's really when I was able to resume elective surgery, thanks to, uh, thanks to the state of Florida and other forward-thinking states. Uh, the impact of uh, COVID on hospital missions, we know that. I mean, it's... it's uh, it was mostly about COVID and other patients with a variety, whether it be malignancies, other illnesses, didn't seek care. And last year we were all paying for it because these all of a sudden these people had worsening of their problems because they avoided care for a long time. Um, now, speaking about the healthcare system, this is you know kind of a cartoon, which for me is frankly not that funny, but it is it is humorous because both the insurance industry and big pharma, they don't really want things to change. Now, I'm not suggesting they're evil or anything, but the reality is they're not like us, whether it be physicians, nurses, techs, uh, people even in offices, uh, hospital workers, they care about the patient. But there are other entities that, let's face it, they're driven by profit. 
um, they answer to Wall Street. And that's understandable. So we just have to find an equilibrium so that it's good and we get that patient well again, which is our, our healthcare system. So there is a silver lining. I already mentioned that. Um, hospitals themselves can leverage a lot of these lessons um, using AI as well. Um, and outsiders are doing this. Now, you, all of you are reading what Amazon, you know, they failed miserably the first time. Uh, Amazon now just bought uh, one medical, which is, I mean, they have millions of patients. So the question is, who is really going to innovate in how the care is delivered? And that's my big argument. And that's what I'm trying to do with ortho now. Um, because the big companies, the Walgreens, et cetera, the, um, uh, the Walmarts, they, they've, got, they've got a lot of capital. But to make healthcare efficient, we have to make some tweaks on it. OK, so, you know, you've heard of all these companies, right? <laughs> um, but this is the people, you know, in the trenches. These are the ones who uh, the, the hospital workers here, right? Stay, you know, worked while sick people came in and they were exposed to them. Right. Now, our, our healthcare care system is about four trillion a year. So it's twice as expensive as the next country. And the problem is this health expenditures, if you look on this slide, has gone up 800 percent. Whereas, um, you know, the, the, our wages have only gone up 16%. Now, this slide's a little old. So with, with, with last year, the wage increases that we're seeing in our economy, uh, it, it's significantly more, but it's certainly not 800%. I'm sure everybody wishes it was. <laughs> um, here's the, uh, the, the expenditures as a percent of GDP. So you can see we're, we're at about 20% here uh, approaching it compared to only 5% in the, in the early 60s. The big difference my opinion, not only more technology, so it's going to cost more, but uh, there's there's many more people with their hand in a cookie jar than, than needed, okay? So not, not to beat a dead horse, but there's other countries that spend a fair amount, but we are much more expensive per capita and not always the most efficient, right? Here's, uh, here's somebody who's been in the ER a long time, and the ER is not a place for primary care folks. Let's let's be understand that is a place to go when you have chest pain, when you hit your head and you might have a subdural, or you broke your femur if it's orthopedics, but not if you broke your wrist. You don't need to be in an ER. Um, and in the innovation is very difficult. I, this is a an article from the Harvard Business Review that I I I, um, I summarized in one of the chapters of my book, and there are really six reasons. So I'm not going to go into all of them in too much detail, but this is a nice summary. The people involved, I mentioned those middlemen, they all they all want their piece of the pie, uh, difficult to acquire capital and funding, uh, a lot of regulations, understandably, there should be a lot of regulation in healthcare, but some of it's excessive. Uh, I mentioned technology, the patients and the accountability, right? So those innovations have to be safe. So think about the FDA, about the amount of money to bring a new drug to market, because it has to be safe. So that all makes innovation very difficult. But there are some good ones. And this one's not expensive, right? Telemedicine, all of you know about this. This was almost unheard of before the pandemic. Now look, April, April of 2020, this is an article where they interviewed me in the South Florida Business Journal. Uh, look at the date, that we're still in the middle of lockdown. I had been doing this for years. Part of it is because of my international patients, but even patients in the US and other places before they make the trip to Miami, I want to understand what their problem is. And uh, orthopedics is not as ideal as, say, psychiatry, behavioral health, other issues. But I can get a good idea of what's going on with a patient if they can send me their imaging studies and I can remotely examine them. Uh, this patient here you can see is actually in his car. <laughs> and I did several of those today. Now, look at the date here, 2017. That's well before the pandemic. And this was an art, uh, an interview I did in Mexico, Mexico City, because again, I have many of these patients come from other countries and the patients were using it as well because we uh, we showed them how, okay? Our ortho now, we use telemedicine. So the patient, you know, gets hurt on a soccer field. They can, they can get in a, a, oftentimes an immediate telemedicine appointment. So um, the problem is all these things I mentioned, there's very little feedback from us, all right? And very soon, all of you will be in the trenches of healthcare. And we are the ones that need to speak up. We need to educate the public. 
we need to educate our, our legislators somehow. Okay, so I'm hoping that the book and, and other things like it, including a podcast, which I now have called Fixing Healthcare from the Trenches uh, every other Thursday. Um, I, I have one this Thursday at 9 a.m. Eastern time. And that's only a 15 minute discussion with a healthcare disruptor. And this week it will be Dr. Tom Price. If anybody follows politics a little bit, Tom Price was the Secretary of Health and Human Services uh, in the last administration. And uh, he's an orthopedic surgeon and um, an acquaintance of mine. So he will be my guest, probably the most influential guest I have, former Congressman uh, Tom Price. So I started ortho now for the same reason. I realized that uh, there is a consumerization of healthcare. We all have apps. We all use apps all the time. Why not use them to, to get to, to, to access healthcare or to monitor healthcare? And this will all be changes that your generation will see. Uh, I'm I'm doing it myself, but it, it, it will dramatically change. Okay, so I'm going to show you a case example. Let's let's get to a little bit of medicine. This is a lady who's who's I think walking her dog, a big dog, twisted the finger. She sustained a spiral fracture of the proximal fang. She went to the hospital. All they did is say you need to see an orthopedist. They gave her this uh, these absurd aluminum splints that they use in the ERs or even to urgent cares. So by the time I saw her, I was the third physician, but the only person who knew, knows something about the hand, okay? So, you know, this is a, a story, and I, I could give you stats all day long, but I think most of you want to see examples, real-life examples. So here is a spiral fracture of the proximal phalanx, okay? So you always want to describe x-rays uh, accurately. So spiral meaning it goes around, so it's a twisting injury, and usually the finger um, is rotated. And, and deformed, but you can see here, it's also foreshortened, okay? So this was, they said, finally, they referred her to the hand surgeon. And the problem is it was a plastic surgeon who does have a little bit of hand experience in the residency, but is not a dedicated hand surgeon. How do I know that? Well, this is how they fixed it, okay? So any of you who know, know sufficiently, it doesn't look like it's in the right place. This should be all the way up here, so this is, the finger is foreshortened and uh, still a little, not too twisted, at least he corrected that, okay? But the guy on call was not always the best person. And that's, that's a big problem in our system, right? Because she came to me like this, the finger is shorter. It is in a flexed or bent position with a contracture, meaning she could not straighten that finger, okay? So the x-ray looked like this. It healed completely wrong. Look at the angulation here. All right. And then there's a structure called the volar plate, which is contracted and doesn't allow this middle phalanx to come up this way to straighten the finger. So now I have to re-break or do an osteotomy of that bone. I have to cut the bone. I have to bring it out to length. OK. All right, this is through the extensor tendon and put this plate on. OK. And I have to release the capsule from the palmer side to correct the contracture. And then I pin the joint straight. That's her after having the plate removed, because I had to do that and, re and remove scar tissue. And this is her only two weeks after that second procedure. You can see the stitches, the absorbable stitches are still in place. So I'm going to assume that she has a full fist now because she was this good two weeks later. But my point is not to show a case that fortunately had a good result. The point here is that a lot of money was spent and a lot of heartache for the patient in not seeing the appropriate person Okay, and having to undergo a surgery, which somebody paid for, the patient, uh, and probably an insurance company society, she was out of commission for a while. Let's say she was a manual worker. She's not, but she's a manual worker, and I see these every day. And the delay before they get to me is absurd. And that is the one thing I, I wish I could grab our president and say, look, the one thing you can do to lower health care costs is make sure people go to the right clinician. And that clinician could be a physician assistant, a nurse practitioner, it could be, depending on the complexity of the event. The important thing is that we're all, we can all be connected with this little device that could have sent me that x-ray and said, oh yeah, I, that doesn't need pins. That needs a couple mini screws, not a plate, mini screws, but I had to put a plate because I got her after the fact. Okay. Now, this is going to be shocking to you. More than a third of all emergency room uh, visits are actually inaccurate for orthopedic injuries. Now, that's not surprising. 
any of you who are thinking of going into emergency medicine, which by the way, did not come even close to filling the match. Uh, I don't know if that's related to COVID, but it, it, it could be a real crisis. But I think it's an exciting sector of medicine, but, but you can't expect our, our ER colleagues to have the depth of knowledge of say a hand injury like I do, or a spine injury like my colleague who was doing, who did four big spine surgeries outpatient today, Dr. John Hyde, okay? So, but we can use, again, technology to be able to transmit that, that X-ray and, get, and con get connected. And medicine is way behind in its use of technology. And I think finally it's gonna start catching up. Um, a friend of mine wrote this paper. Uh, I found it even hard to believe until I heard his presentation almost 10 years ago. More than 90% of pediatric fractures are not, not correctly splinted uh, in both an ER and a general urgent care setting. That, that is pretty concerning, okay? But it's because healthcare has become more complex. Uh, the concept that was sort of shoved down our throat many years is this gatekeeper where the poor overworked primary care physician was made to see these cases to then give an approval, an authorization. I can tell you, my friends who are primary care doctors say it's absurd. So I'm, I'm busy managing people's diabetes and hypertension and, and, and picking up on subtle uh, uh, disease processes because I'm, I am the first, the primary doctor is the first, that's why they're primary. But if you have deep shoulder pain, that's not necessarily the best place to go. And then ends up, that ends up actually costing more money because when physicians who are an expert in a certain area, they tend to order more tests, okay? And I'm not even talking about the malpractice uh, system but just in general, because they're trying to make a diagnosis, but they don't have that clinical gestalt. The gestalt comes from years of training, years of seeing patients where you walk in a room, you go, oh, that shoulder pain's got it. most likely this because it is a 58-year-old uh, female uh, works on an assembly line, blah, 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 blah. All right. And then I already have an idea. Okay. So uh, <laughs> this is the, um, the cover picture of an, a local article in, in Miami where they talked about the two things I'm doing about my 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 practice and and ortho now, but um, that I took care of the one of the guys from the Tiger King. I I, I actually never watched the show, but um, he's he's one of the trainers, so he, he comes to my office a lot. Um, so I think there are seven solutions. I'm going to run through this very quickly, but I think we got to involve us, the providers, minimize that middleman, insurance companies. My dream would be to see them be nonprofit. They shouldn't be answering to Wall Street. Okay, but I, I think that if they do well, that they should be rewarded. And I have no problem with that. I am a capitalist, but for healthcare, I don't think we should be answering to Wall Street. Um, all in one centers, I explained to you what my center's like, where you can come in and ER imaging, everything's in one place. That makes it very, very cost efficient um, and time efficient for patients. We're all busy, right? Uh, transparency. Hopefully, we're going to continue on that. I, I know the last uh, administration was pushing for this, but uh, it's, you know, the hospitals aren't often complying, but I think it's going to happen. Uh, all of us have to collaborate, please. The one thing I could tell all of you is that hopefully, in most cases, organic chemistry is finished. <laughs> that was where the competition was, right? Sophomore year in college, like, let's stop competing. All right. We all got into med school. We all, you know, hopefully, can most of us will do the specialty we want. So let's not compete, let's collaborate, okay, in educating the public, okay? So we want rapid, efficient care, one stop shopping if possible. We want patients not to be combative with us. It's, it's, it's very much, patients have uh, now developed this sort of combative attitude with us physicians. Uh, and, and again, largely due to the intricacies of access, access into care and the insurance industry has a lot to do with that. So we, we need to, to change that. And to do that, we are going to um, we're going to need to get us involved in that healthcare conversation. So not just what you see on CNN uh, or the lobbyists or politicians. Or we 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 have to get involved. Okay, so this is what I'm doing in my small part. I did write that book. I visited with my children uh, about three years ago. My son is actually taller than I am now, so that was three years ago. And that's a book I wrote with Senator. Bill Cassidy, he is a gastroenterologist. His wife is a general surgeon from uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And he is obviously being a physician, he's a great proponent of healthcare reform, but there isn't that many Dr. Cassidy's, but there's a lot of us. So we need to make a noise. Uh, so this is a fundraiser I held uh, at my home with Vern Buchanan, who uh, will likely be the next chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee in Washington. They 
determine spending on CMS, which is uh, basically Medicare, okay? So Vern Buchanan, remember that name. Okay, so this is what I often feel like, and many of us will because we're just this big system, but we do, we are the ones with the, with the knowledge. So we have to, uh, we have to wield that. So we have to streamline all these middlemen because it's just adding cost. Here's, here's this, this that's hopefully going to be turned around now, uh, hopefully in, in, uh, in, in Congress, um, diminish this authorization process where a doctor orders a lab test and goes through all these steps for it to be appealed or authorized. Now, isn't the doctor ordering the test the most expert person to know if the test is needed, right? Now, does it mean that there aren't physicians who are over-ordering and, and, you know, there are bad apples in every profession? So what I say is we need oversight, not authorization, okay? This is a problem. Way too many administrators, all of this, the growth, compared to physicians. It's only been a... Uh, uh, 16% growth or something like that since the 70s. So not much. And, and I don't have to tell you about the reimbursement. That's another challenge. Uh, how uh, Medicare cut us again this year. But, you know, I think we can change it. Now, these folks are not going to help us, right? This is from uh, almost 10 years ago. Look at the salaries, okay, of, of these uh, of these insurance CEOs, okay, and, and you know, pharma, okay? And then there's a lot of fraud, and I'm embarrassed to say, and I'm going to be very upfront with it, that Miami, Dade County, is the Medicare fraud capital of the country. And there are a number of reasons for that, but uh, it's very upsetting to me practicing here. Um, this is uh, one real piece of work. I'd love one crack at him. Um, that guy stole bill, a billion dollars, okay? Um, here's a physician who was the president of the AMA, the first and only orthopedic surgeon, Andy Gurman to head the AMA, which is by far the largest medical organization in the country. Uh, I'm not always thrilled about what they've done to protect us physicians, but you know we have to engage. And uh, uh, Andy happens to be a hand surgeon from Pennsylvania, and he spent the day uh, with me in the operating room, which was a, a real honor, okay? I mentioned this nonprofit, one, all-in-one facilities. So just one example is, is the center I, I um, I, and I put together uh, in Doral, which is very near Miami International Airport. And I do welcome uh, uh, visitors. So I encourage all of you that you can write me through the website um, and, and, and my email if needed. Um, these are all shifts that we saw. All right, more di outpatient diagnostic centers, retail medicine, right? We're seeing that with, with the Walmarts of, and Amazons of the world, um, the Minute Clinic and CVS. Dispensing medication doesn't have to be in a pharmacy, right? Telemedicine. So all of this are, are being accelerated by the pandemic. And I think it's the good thing. But I've been writing about this for a long time. You see no gray hair there, much younger. Uh, so I've been, I've been talking about this for a long time. These specialty urgent care, specialty walk-in centers, because they are good for all of these things, much like general urgent cares are, much less cost, less weight, but with the expertise. Okay. So my my um, uh, disruption in, in orthopedic care is sits in this corner where we have the high expertise and the high ease of access, okay? So the problem with the ER is not very easy. Once you get there, you're waiting hours. And the expertise, as I showed you by that by that paper, um, is not that high. So this is, this, is, this is the problem. And this is an analysis, I won't bore you, but showing the difference between a occupational health center and an orthopedic walk-in center when a worker comes in with, uh, with wrist pain. Okay, and this is just one example. The app, this is an app I, I encourage all of you to take 10 seconds and download it on your phone and, and you know, give me feedback. We, we're gonna be upgrading it as soon as I find the right strategic partner, but the app is something that you can click this button and say, I'm on my way now. So you can be on the soccer field, you can be, you know, home, uh, you know, putting up a Christmas tree and you fell off the ladder, uh, or you could be an employer, and you can then uh, uh, some a, a nurse at a at a, at a at a assisted living facility, and you can then hit that button, the referral, and send somebody, um, and then the, the clinicians will then uh, communicate. So this is something that uh, would love to get more people engaged with the app and and giving us feedback. 
Um, we're going to bring this directly to a, the corporate America because people are busy at work. So if you can engage uh, empl you know, employers to bring these advantages, this and other types of healthcare to the workplace, that might be a very cost-effective solution to lower healthcare costs. Okay, so there's been a lot of uh, articles written about this uh, over the years with Ortho Now. Um, this was in a national uh, 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 e-newsletter called Markets Insider. So in a business newsletter, they actually mentioned, hey, you know, the specialty centers could be the future. Okay, and as I mentioned, COVID-19 accelerated transparency. Uh, this is an article written by one of the uh, former, um, uh, a, a co-founder of Ortho Now. Uh, doctors collaborating, very important. That's me with an old partner. Uh, the collaboration there wasn't as good as it can be, and that's why we're no longer a group. So we can all learn. Uh, and educating the public. And, you know, we all want to save the whales. We want to save trees. We want to do all these social issues, right, including, you know, prop racial issues, which, you know, fortunately, they were brought to light by some very unfortunate events. But we need to understand that these sort of um, injustices are happening every day to patients, okay? And it is a system that really needs to be reformed in a real way, not just insuring the uninsured. I mean, that's, that's good too, but it's how we deliver the care to those uninsured and to the less fortunate society. Because if we can make it more efficient, there's plenty of money left over in this economy to take care of everybody. I, that, that I am convinced. And I worked in a public hospital. Okay. So patients are consumers. The free market system should prevail. Quality right, will influence cost. So quality really saves money. I, I really believe personally in health insurance should be more catastrophic care. I, I honestly believe people when they go to their primary doctor or even some specialist should pay something. Okay. Because then they would they would take care of themselves a little bit more if, if they had a little skin in the game. Okay. Uh, and then all these cost savings would fund the safety net. Okay, so uh, this, I don't know how many of you remember the uh, most interesting man in the world, in, but you know, since I grew my beard, somebody was teasing me. So this is one meme, but this is a competing one <laughs> where I was in Orlando for a medical conference. And what I, what I did, and this is true, uh, by the way, this should be ICD-10. So this is the, uh, the nomenclature for diagnoses. There actually is a separate code for being bitten by an alligator or a crocodile. Two separate codes. Now, if that's not ridiculous bureaucracy, I don't know what is. Because that's what, that's what a lot of people you know, in Washington and, and these committees are wasting time doing, is coming up with this absurd amount of codes. Okay, we, don't, we really don't need that. Okay, so, but we always want to strive to improve. We are in a profession that you never stop learning. Last week, I, uh, I was honored to be faculty again at the Philadelphia hand course, but there were 350 hand surgeons there and about 800 uh, hand therapists. It's the biggest hand therapy course in the world. It's every year in Philadelphia. Um, and the people there, I mean, they're everywhere from the 30s to their late 70s and still learning. So we're always learning. And uh, I was honored to be to, to be involved, uh, be one of the five founders of this center. This is our beautiful auditorium. This is the Cadaver Lab. There's uh, 40 stations, now 37. Uh, we took a few of them for something else, but uh, this is a very big lab. Uh, so this is the book. Uh, hopefully some of you downloaded the app. I'd love to hear the feedback on that. But the, the book outlines a lot of things I talked about in more detail, hopefully, hopefully more interesting than my speaking. Uh, do we have time, uh, Michael, for this short video? Yeah, no problem. Okay. Tell me, uh, let me see if you can hear it. So give me a thumbs up if you can hear the, the sound. All right. How can you help affect meaningful change to healthcare delivery in America? Dr. Alejandro Padilla exposes the dangers and unnecessary obstacles and challenges to the care your clinician wants you to receive. I understand what we need, what we don't need, what's superfluous, what's vital, what's efficient, and what's cost effective.
It's an insider account of the complex barriers within U.S. healthcare from the providers and patients' perspective. So the, part, the problem is, is that we're not hearing from the people who are really delivering the care. The coronavirus has exposed the problem, making now the time to force reform. real solutions from a doctor with experience. The bureaucracy has gotten completely out of control. Okay, so. Okay, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Coronavirus bleeding amongst the colleagues. That's kind of funny because I'd forgotten about was in here. Um, that was when I, I was actually in Australia when Tom Hanks also was in Australia was diagnosed with COVID and all of a sudden the entire world cared about COVID because a celebrity came down with it. But that's that's just that's our society, right? Um, but these are uh, two very important colleagues. This was the president of the Australian Health Society and another Australian innovative uh, risk surgeon, good friends. And uh, that was at the museum in Melbourne. And you know that was right when it started. When nobody was shaking hands, right? So now we do the fist bumps. But at that time, people were touching elbows, and and I just think it's hilarious. Uh, and this is, you know, the Zoom meetings we all we all uh, have been on that. So, uh, you know, this is uh, the mark is now in Brazil as well. Um, I've done live surgery, so these are things that we can do to educate each other. But in the end, it's all about you know the patients. You know, everything we're doing is um, is to help patients, and that's why I'm passionate about uh, us engaging. That means whether social media, sharing, you know, something that you heard that's interesting, sharing it, not just liking it, you know, accumulating likes. I, I, I feel it doesn't do anything. I think when people share um, something interesting that they see, and that's what I tend to do when I read something that I want people to know about. Okay, so we must change. Uh, that's my daughter now. <laughs> uh, actually, a couple, a couple, couple of years ago. Um, but you know, I care about this because obviously I'm thinking about the future. And, you know, I'm not getting any younger, so I want to make sure that healthcare is good and, and all the generations after us. Um, this is how you can get a hold of me. The, one of the best ways really through the website. You can email me directly, but in the website, you'll, you'll see a lot of information. And uh, when it says contact uh, Dr. Badia, I, I, I pride myself on, on trying to answer personally as much as I can. And sometime if you're in Miami, we'll, we'll be able to share a glass of wine together. Um, basically, it. That's what, uh, that's what I have on the topic. Thank you, Michael. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you, Dr. Bradia, for getting this all together. This is, it's not a topic that we hear about often on virtual shadowing. Yeah. A lot of times it's about specialties, um, which, I mean, uh, has its own importance, but this is something that I think uh, has urgency, right, for, for people to know. So I really do appreciate you for getting this all together um, and, and letting us know what's really behind the curtain um, for healthcare. Just to start off with some questions, earlier uh, in your presentation, you mentioned that you took a fellowship. You went out internationally to Germany, right? Um, yes. I believe that's called an AO fellowship. Would you mind elaborating a little more about what AO is, if that's a specific organization, accreditation that yeah. isn't known in America or, or at least popularized in America? Uh, no, actually it is. It was founded in Germany and Switzerland by really six uh, forward-thinking orthopedic surgeons who really paved the path for for treating fractures more aggressively. It used to be, you know, you, you, I think all of you, you know, have seen the cartoons or on TV, somebody in traction, right? Where, you know, they're, they're lying in a hospital bed, they have a leg up on a sling, they got their arm up. And that's the way we used to treat fractures. We used to uh, immobilize them, cast them. And what these surgeons brought really to the world was the concept of, you know, doing open reduction, meaning opening, bringing a bone back, just like that finger example, bringing a bone back where it belongs and stabilizing it with appropriate rigid internal fixation. So that uh, AO stands for, uh, I did spend only five weeks in Germany, but I learned enough. 
So I will tell you, it stands for Arbeitingen Osteotinten Fragen. That means fixed bone, basically. So that's an organization that worldwide in teaches. They do they do workshops in um, you know in, in Africa and Southeast Asia. And, and then I learned when I was at Bellevue, I took a course, an AO course, taught by AO faculty. And now I I am AO faculty, um, and I've taught courses before. Um, there's another competing organization, more for the hand and maxillofacial, called. Um, um, uh, IBRA, International Bone Research Association, IBRA, I-B-R-A. And I'm uh, co-chairing a course in Miami for the eighth or ninth time uh, coming up in three weeks. So in three weeks, my co-chairman is actually from Germany. The faculty is coming from Brazil, uh, Mississippi, uh, Spain, Colombia. So um, so these courses go on. And then I, I, I did a fellowship in Germany. Because not only did I want to learn the topic uh, better, but I actually learned a lot about how the German private healthcare system works. It was not at a hospital. So I think there was a lot of foreshadowing for me about what I would do in the future. Uh, because this very, very uh, forward thinking uh, hand surgeon had his own operating rooms in an office, uh, very efficient. Well, that's interesting to hear. Another thing I wanted to ask is, you went through how you have, you know, everything from your own surgical center to um, specifically specializing in hand surgery. And also um, you mentioned um, x-rays, right? That they can take. So it's a center that, you know, they can get their all-in-one care at. Um, yes. Convenient, efficient, like you said, um, saves on cost for patients. With that said though, I'm sure there's a lot of hurdles going through the process of actually making that a reality. Um, and it's not really... I mean, I'm in Texas myself, on the west side of Texas, at least, but even on the east side of Texas, it's not really common that you would hear about, right, someone having um, that all-in-one system. So what was the learning curve behind that in, in making that a possibility, right, in having all those components all together? Because I'm sure that a lot of costs came with that, um, a lot of business management came with it. Yeah, and I, and I, I, I you know, I confess I was not that well prepared for it. I didn't like a lot of colleagues now are getting MBAs or at least taking business courses. And, you know, if I could do it all over again, I would have done a lot more. I would have taken say a basic accounting course so I can read a P and L, you know, profit loss statement uh, better. I've, I've had to learn. Uh, the reason I did it is, you know, we all learn from, from, you know, different people along the way. Right. And when I joined and we created the Miami hand center, one of the first things we did was build our own operating rooms. There were two tiny ORs. I mean, they, they wouldn't even be approved nowadays uh, because all the regulations changed, but they were small. But we did more surgery in those two operating rooms uh, than, than many small hospitals. We were five busy hand surgeons and many times they, we were operating through the night. So when I left the group, I said, okay, obviously I have to have an office. All we, we always have, you know, any orthopedist, I mean, should have x-ray in their office, right? But I went beyond that. I said, you know, a lot of my, I do a lot of shoulder work and every shoulder patient I see just about really needs an MRI. So, so I made sure I put an MRI, I have ultrasound now. I don't have a CT scanner, but I do have live fluoroscopy. It's like a live x-ray image and I can put that underneath the image. So I have all the diagnostic tools. So yes, um, it, it, you, you could call it a risk, but I think everyone listening should understand that we really have a unique skill and you have to have confidence in yourself. I, I didn't see, while I knew it would be difficult, I never thought, okay, I'm gonna invest this money, I'm gonna it may take out some loans I'm, and that I would fail. Why? Because I knew the service I'm providing is necessary. It's necessary. So if you have that confidence in your abilities and that it's needed in the marketplace and you're filling a niche, there's no reason. And, and frankly, Michael, there are there are somewhat similar centers. Um, I, I know some colleagues, you know, I only know for hand surgery, but I know some colleagues in um, in Houston who uh, who have, you know, a center where they, they, you know, and they operate almost exclusively in an ASC. Um, what the, my biggest innovation was the ortho now, because it's not just, oh, it's a walk-in center. A lot of my colleagues have that. What What is the innovation is, the concept of putting it in convenient places for patients, putting in a strip mall next to a CrossFit, next to a karate studio, next to a, a supermarket where you have all the soccer moms shopping. I and mean, you want to put it in a place where it's accessible to the public. 
Okay, because most hospitals, it's not real easy. That's you get there and you go, well, gosh, you know, where am I going to park? I mean, it's it's an ordeal, right? And then using this, and and I don't have to convince your generation that this is going to change everything, but um, but that that was part and parcel. That's why I want the feedback from the listeners about the app, because um, you know, and we'll know if you register when you go to the app. Uh, to use all of the features, you have to register, which takes all of about probably 20 seconds for most of you to type in. Um, and, and, and you know, again, we'd love to hear the feedback. So it's just a matter of being confident in yourself and realizing that there is a need in the marketplace, in your community. And yeah, not being afraid to take a little risk. Be confident in, in your abilities. 100%. It definitely does come with risks. And, and I mean, fear is not going to help with that. Another thing I wanted to ask is, being in a subspecialty, being in, in a surgical subspecialty, what drew you to specifically that? Um, was there, like, you know, there's two decisions that come with that. It's first of all, being in a surgical specialty, and it's second of all, being in a subspecialty. Um, so right. for you, what was the impetus behind that? What was the spark uh, behind that? Well, as, to, as, as common, uh, there are, you know, s- several influences right throughout your life. Now, I, um, and I talk about this in the first chapter of my book. I, I was born in Cuba and in my maternal side, but my father's family is from Spain. Uh, on my maternal side, there were many physicians in Cuba. And, and Cuba always had a very good reputation for healthcare and medicine. So that was ingrained in me. And then my grandmother, my paternal from, from Valencia, Spain, my, my grandmother, who kind of raised me a typical immigrant, you know, first five or six years, my parents were working, you know, day and night. And my... Um, my, my grandmother was right. I was very close to her and she had a terrible rheumatoid arthritis. So when I was eight years old, I went to Columbia Presbyterian to see a hand surgeon. Uh, and I remember this vividly. Uh, I sat there, my feet didn't even touch the ground. I was sitting in a chair, I'm watching and I'm looking around all his degrees and what he's, how he's helping my grandmother. It just, it just imprinted in me. Now, what I didn't know, and again, I go into a little more detail in the book, but what I didn't know is that Dr. Bob Carroll, who died a number of years ago, had a, a full page uh, New York Times obituary, by the way, which is very, very uncommon. Uh, Bob Carroll trained a guy named Joe Imbriglia. Well, Joe Imbriglia was my mentor in Pittsburgh. So I did not know when I was eight years old. Uh, here I'm saying, you know, 40 years later, you know, 50 years later, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm talking about the guy who trained my mentor. So to me, that was the biggest influence. When I was a medical student, uh, I, I just found that the orthopedic residents that I met seemed to love what they were doing. Uh, I met a lot of them in, in, in the med school gym. You know, orthopedists are known for being very, you know, fitness and sports oriented. So that was not uh, uncommon. And then when I, and then in terms of hand surgery, I realized how diverse it is. And it's funny because in Miami, being the way the culture down here, people immediately say, oh, hand surgeon, what do you do? You take wrinkles out? You make, you know, like, I'm like, no, you call me when you put your hand in the circular saw. So, you know, then, then they get the message. So it's a very diverse specialty. You know, we do the trauma, the congenital, you know, pediatric case. We do the arthritis, uh, old, you know, older patients. We do sports injuries. We do vascular problems. We do nerve compressions. We do tumors. So it's a very, very diverse specialty, even though a lot of people don't know about it. A hundred percent. And one last question, just to wrap it up is you've studied at quite a few places, right? Along the East coast, um, in the North Northeast. And now you practice in Miami, Florida, um, down South. What are your thoughts on location of practice? I mean, you can specify this to your own subspecialty or just in general to physicians, but I know from a few sessions, we've heard of the differences between rural and and, uh, urban. And also for some subspecialties, not all but there's definitely been some subspecialties where they're so subspecialized that they require certain resources at an academic center. Um, like, right. for example, we had otology, which is a subspecialty of um, ENT. ENT. And, and he was he, he had only a few locations that he could really realistically choose in terms of career options. Um, so right. can you speak a little yeah, more? You can't that? be an otologist in a small town. But a small town really needs primary care doctors. It needs OBGYNs. It needs pediatricians. It needs 100%. You know, so, um, no, that's a very good point. Uh, so the first thing I would say is, you know, look, once you finish your training, look for opportunities and places where you really want to live, where you're going to be happy. 
So I'm a city boy, but yet my, my only sibling, my sister, is in uh, a smaller town in North Carolina, and she likes small towns. So, you know, if, if she had studied medicine, it doesn't matter. She she would never be in Miami or Manhattan where I train, right? Uh, so I, I think the first decision is what kind of lifestyle do you want? And then obviously seek out areas that, that you know, probably need your specialty. The, the, the fortunate thing for most young physicians now is you're needed in almost every place. There is a shortage uh, of physicians. It's, it's projected to be about 140,000 shortage of physicians in, in the coming decade. So my recommendation to you is make friends with your nurse practitioners, with your PA friends, because um, all of them are going to be critical uh, be, because of, because of our, our projections in, in terms of the amount of people we've trained and the growth of our population. So I think that, you know, we do still, despite all the challenges I mentioned, we, do, we still live in a country that's very good for physicians. We just have to, you know, make some major tweaks. 100%. It's called the land of opportunities. And like you said, um, yes, it there's is. definitely some things that we can improve on within our healthcare system. But like I said, at the, the, at the beginning of this Q&A here, I really do appreciate you for taking the time to, to get this all together. I have some last reminders for our shadowers. For those of you who would like to earn credit for your attendance, um, we have a quiz. That quiz is posted in the chat box and also on our virtual shouting page. If you're unfamiliar, our virtual shouting page is a quiz um, on the left and right hand side. If you scroll down, scroll down just a bit, they're titled by the day. So we have sessions on Mondays and Thursdays. This is going to be our Monday quiz. Click that Monday quiz. It's going to direct you to a Google form, 10 questions, and you need to get six or more to pass. Once you do pass, you'll receive a certificate sent to your email. Just check your spam in case you don't get it in your inbox. And if you don't find it in either your inbox or your spam folder, please do send us an email. We're happy to help. That email, by the way, it's included um, down in our uh, description. I'm also going to be including the link to Dr. Badia's book soon on our description. Um, definitely give it a give it a, a look, give it a review if you do read it um, and give Dr. Badia a follow. Feel free to contact him. He's been gracious enough to list his contacts and um, he has a lot of experience um, over these years. For our next shadowing session, we're gonna be joined by Ms. Faltat. She's a certified nurse anesthetist. That's gonna be this Thursday. Usually our sessions are on Mondays and Thursdays at 7 p.m. Central. Um, and then just one last thing is that we have Instagram, we have our listserv. If you didn't catch me at the very beginning, both are great ways to stay tuned with more shadowing sessions. This week will be the last shadowing session that we have until um, two more in, in May. And then that's going to end our shouting sessions for the rest of the spring. Afterwards, we're going to resume in the summer in June. So again, these two sessions, this today and this Thursday, those are gonna be the last sessions until our next sessions on, uh, or on May 1st and May 4th, which will be the end of our spring semester and then we'll continue on in June. Like I said, it's going to be updated over our Instagram page. Um, Dr. Badia, you have your podcast. You want to talk a little more about it? Yeah, I just put it up there. It, it, it turns out it's not every Thursday. Um, I decided to make it every other week. So it is this Thursday. And um, I don't think I have it on my computer yet, the flyer. But if you go to my uh, Instagram page, at Badia Hand, you'll see the announcement. Uh, this week is probably our most illustrious guest. I mentioned Tom Price. I, I got to really chat with him uh, about two weeks ago in Vegas at a healthcare uh, transaction conference. And he was, for those of you who don't know, Tom Price was the Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, probably more powerful than the Surgeon General uh, in terms of influencing healthcare um, uh, in the US. So Tom Price will be my, my guest, but the, the, the important thing to know is it's only 15 minutes. So no matter how busy you are, I've had colleagues who tell me they delay a surgery or they stop seeing patients and they listen in and um, you'll, you'll glean some important things from my, my guests. So I hope that uh, all of you can listen in. You, all, all you have to do is Google fixing healthcare from the trenches and you'll, we, you know, it's now on Spotify and Apple podcasts, but the visual is on uh, YouTube and uh, I, I think it's still Instagram. So, um, so that that's all. I just you know want to want to get engagement from people before all the reasons I spoke about. Absolutely. I hope you all can give it a listen. Like I said, um, feel free to contact Dr. Badia. Again, Dr. Badia, thank you so much for for gathering this all together. 
Um, this was such a great session, and it's been a while since we we had a few hand surgery specialists, but it's been a quite a quite a long time since we talked about hand surgery. So it's also great to hear more about this specialty. Again, thank you so much. Okay, thank you all. Have a have a great night.